brachial plexus injuries, Herb's palsy, and Klumke's palsy. All right, in this class, today we're going to talk about brachial plexus injuries. The brachial plexus is a complex network of nerves that controls movement and sensation in the upper limb. Any damage to this network can result in severe motor and sensory deficits. Now, the two major types of brachial plexus injuries are Herb's palsy, which affects the upper trunk, and Klumke's palsy, which affects the lower trunk. These injuries commonly occur due to birth trauma, excessive traction, or direct trauma to the shoulder. Let's break down each of them in detail. Herb's palsy, upper trunk injury, C5, C6. Herb's palsy occurs when the C5 and C6 nerve roots are damaged. The most common cause is excessive lateral flexion of the neck, which can happen due to birth injuries or trauma. In newborns, this injury is often associated with shoulder dystocia, a complication during vaginal delivery where the baby's shoulder gets stuck behind the mother's pubic bone. If excessive traction is applied to the head during delivery, it stretches the upper trunk of the brachial plexus. In adults, Herb's palsy can occur due to trauma, such as a motorcycle or car accident, where the individual falls on their head and shoulder simultaneously. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology. Since C5 and C6 contribute to the axillary, musculocutaneous, and suprascapular nerves, damage to these roots leads to dysfunction in the muscles they supply. This results in a characteristic clinical presentation known as the waiter's tip posture. In this posture, the arm is adducted and internally rotated because the deltoid and supraspinatus are weak, leading to an inability to abduct the arm. The forearm is extended and pronated since the biceps brachii, brachialis, and brachioradialis are affected, impairing elbow flexion and forearm supination. The wrist is flexed because the wrist flexors remain unopposed. Patients also show weakness in external rotation due to impaired function of the infraspinatus and supraspinatus muscles. Additionally, the biceps reflex is absent as the C5 to C6 reflex arc is damaged. In infants, one key finding is an asymmetric Moro reflex. Normally, when you gently allow the baby's head to drop, their arms should abduct and extend symmetrically. But in Herb's palsy, the affected side shows a weaker or absent Moro reflex. A useful mnemonic to remember the weakened muscles in Herb's palsy is DIBS with injury, D, deltoid, I, infraspinatus, B, biceps brachii, S. Supraspinatus. W. Wrist extensors. Now let's move on to management. The good news is that most cases improve with conservative treatment. Early physical therapy is essential to prevent muscle contractures and maintain range of motion. Splinting may be used to support the limb in a functional position. In severe cases where nerve damage is extensive and recovery is slow, surgical intervention, such as nerve grafting or nerve transfer, may be required. Klumka's palsy, lower trunk injury, C8, T1. Now let's move on to Klumke's palsy, which affects the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, specifically the C8 and T1 nerve roots. This type of injury is commonly caused by hyperabduction of the arm, which occurs when someone tries to catch themselves while falling by grabbing onto something, like a tree branch. It can also result from birth trauma where excessive upward traction is applied to the baby's arm during delivery. Another important cause is compression of the lower brachial plexus over time due to conditions like a pancos tumor, a lung tumor at the apex of the lung, or a cervical rib. These conditions cause chronic irritation and dysfunction of the lower trunk nerves. Now let's discuss the pathophysiology. Since C8 and T1 primarily control the intrinsic muscles of the hand and flexors of the wrist and fingers, Damage to these nerves leads to severe weakness in hand movements. The hallmark feature of Klumka's palsy is the claw hand deformity. In claw hand, the MCP joints are hyperextended due to unopposed action of the extensor muscles. The IP joints are flexed as the lumbricals, which normally balance finger movements, are paralyzed. Additionally, patients exhibit severe weakness of intrinsic hand muscles, including the thenar and hypothenar muscles lumbricals, and interossi. 
This results in impaired grip and fine motor skills, making it difficult for the patient to grasp objects. Another important feature of Klumka's palsy, especially if the injury is located high in the brachial plexus, is preganglionic Horner's syndrome. This happens when the sympathetic fibers running alongside the lower brachial plexus are disrupted. The patient presents with the classic triad, ptosis, drooping eyelid, meiosis, constricted pupil, anhydrosis, lack of sweating on the affected side. Additionally, if the injury is caused by a pancose tumor or cervical rib, it can also compress the subclavian vessels, leading to decreased peripheral pulses in the affected arm. Now let's talk about management. Just like Herb's palsy, physical therapy and occupational therapy play a crucial role in rehabilitation. Orthotic support can help improve hand function and prevent contractures. If conservative management fails, surgical options like nerve transfer or tendon surgery may be considered to restore some function. Thanks for watching.